large numbers of the enemy out in the open during daylight. At that time, we didn't know what they were doing, whether they intended to reinforce ANLAC or whether they were drawing from ANLAC or whether they were going to assault Dong Wan. But we did catch them out in the open. I think they were probably following a preset plan to occupy those areas. Nonetheless, we inflicted a large number of casualties on them. Golf Company arrived via landing craft shortly before 1000 in the morning with its two tanks. I moved over to Golf Company and made sure that their commander, Captain J.R. Vargas, a tremendous combat leader, was certain of what he was to do. He was. They landed, moved around the right flank of Bravo Company at Anlac and assaulted Dido. And after some very heavy fighting, back and forth, pushed their way into the village and drew clear to the other side. Now, this village, like all the hamlets in that area, were very heavily fortified with excellent bunkers that could withstand the crushing action of enemy tanks. These were A-frame type bunkers, and they were well connected to each other by communication trenches and protected by various types of fighting positions in between all of which were extremely well camouflaged. And these positions were mutually supporting so that in order to attack and seize one bunker, you were exposed to the fire from at least two other bunkers. So it was very difficult for infantry to move through those bunkers. But after several hours, Dolph Company was successful and they took fairly heavy casualties in the process, but they fought their way through to the other side. It's about 10.30 in the morning, we landed, the ramps went down. I had already given the uh, frag order to two up, one back. We had two tanks with us. We moved forward and put the 60 mic mics in the, in the tree line. I remember the, uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of rice paddies to cross, 700 meters. I called in a lot of smoke, artillery. Uh, we went forward. Uh, we were under fire immediately. It never did ease up. It was both artillery, rockets, small arms, uh, bunkers. There were so many bunkers to take. I think every Marine could have taken his own bunker. That's how many bunkers were there. We got into the village. Uh, the NVA were well entrenched. They were well in bunkers. Uh, they were good fighters. Uh, I respect them very much. But we rolled right through them and took bunker after bunker after bunker. And I remember taking two myself. I think uh, there were other Marines that took uh, one or two bunkers by themselves also. We got into the village, and at that time, uh, we, uh, it slowed down. They broke contact with us. They were pulling back. The tanks uh, uh, didn't want to come in with us anymore because they were out of ammunition. I can recall chasing one of the tanks and getting the phone in the back and saying, hey, I need you to come back. I need your psychological effect. I remember the response, hell no, I'm out of ammo. And that's when I remember General Weiss uh, <clears throat> get on the line saying, if you don't turn that goddamn tank around, I'm going to shoot you out of the sand right here. As we emerged from the, uh, from the landing craft vehicles, uh, I recall getting the, uh, the order from uh, Captain Vargas as to how we were to maneuver the terrain in front of us. Uh, we did it by uh, uh, fire team up uh, uh, one at a time uh, under uh, intense rifle fire. Uh, there was a, a lot of quick spurts of uh, short running movement by my troops uh, as we crossed the, uh, the uh, terrain uh, that was laced with, with uh, bullets. It wasn't long, however, before the enemy organized a counterattack and began to push Dolf Company out of the positions it had fought for so hard. I ordered Dolf Company to assume a tight perimeter in the eastern end of the village in a position that they thought they could hold while we tried to get reinforcements to Golf Company and push the enemy back. We were unable, however, to relieve him until the following day. We did try, but we were unsuccessful. Later that afternoon, we attempted to move across the open area, both with Hotel Company and Foxtrot Company. But as soon as they left their covered positions at Dong Wan, they came under heavy enemy fire and were pinned down in the open area. And it would have been suicide to move across that 
open area under such heavy fire. We mounted Bravo Company, which had then received new leaders from their parent battalion on top of amphibian tractors and moved them north across the open rice paddy quickly to attempt to crack Dido again from the south. However, as they reached the edge of Dido, Bravo Company came under withering fire from enemy positions. They were unable to move into the village and were pinned down in the area just short of the main battle positions. So there we were at that point, with Bravo Company pinned down in the open opposite Dido, Foxtrot and Hotel in Dong Wan, and my command group and some of our headquarters people located in Anlock. It was this point that my morale was raised a few notches because Echo Company arrived. Now Echo Company, under the command of Captain Jim Livingston, had been taken away from my operational command two days before this uh, battle to guard a bridge on Highway 1 north of the city of Dong Ha. They had to move overland on foot to reach our position. Captain Livingston knew the desperate situation that our battalion was in, and he moved as quickly as he could. He bypassed enemy strong points, which were set up to delay his movement into our area. We were hearing uh, bits of information about what was going on with the battalion over the radio while we were guarding the bridge above Dong Ha, but we had a feeling that our company commander, Captain Jim Livingston, knew a lot more because he was very anxious for us to rejoin the battalion as soon as possible. Uh, as we were making our return trip, we traveled along the western flank of this NVA force that we were going to encounter the next day and we uh, met with a number of pockets of resistance. And in fact, for many of the Marines that were with us, it was the first time that they'd actually seen the enemy. So the adrenaline was flowing and, and they were anxious to engage the enemy and pursue the enemy. And uh, because we were the lead platoon in this company column, whenever we got bogged down, it, it slowed down the entire company. And even though it was very tempting to uh, go after what we saw, uh, Jim Livingston knew that our mission was to rejoin the battalion as soon as possible. So he was regularly on the radio telling us to disengage and to move forward as, as quickly as we could. But he arrived about 1700 on the second day of the battle to the point where he had to cross a fairly wide stream that separated his company from Anlat. The water, if I recall, was about five foot deep, and we were loaded to the top of our heads with gears you might well surmise. So we had to figure out a way to get across that doggone uh, creek where we could get engaged and uh, get linked up with the, the magnificent bastards. So the only way I could figure out to get us across there was I took all the tall guys, including myself, uh, we took all the gear off of them, we put them out in the middle of the stream, about 10 or 12 of them, if I recall. So we, and then we passed man to man or tall man to tall man, if you will, all the short guys with all the gear and sort of had a classic stream crossing. I was very happy to see Jim Livingston and he was raring to get into the fight. His first mission, along with the recon platoon under Bill Muter, was to help evacuate Bravo from its position in front of Dido and get it and its wounded and dead back into the village of Anlac, where we could further evacuate the casualties and reorganize that company. This was done mostly under the cover of darkness, and we were successful in bringing Bravo Company back. Now, one of the interesting things that happened during the Bravo Company attack, once all of the leaders were wounded or uh, became or, or were killed, uh, unable to uh, function. The command of that depleted unit was taken over by a young Marine who was very nervous and had been in country only a short while. And he was beginning to panic and ask for instructions over the radio. Then the cool, calm, cool voice of Captain J.R. Vargas, 
who himself was in a very tight position on the eastern end of, of Dido, comforted this young Marine and advised him as to what he should do, calmed him down, and he was able to form a defensive perimeter and execute the withdrawal with the help of Echo Company and the reconnaissance platoon under Lieutenant Muter. It wasn't hard to dig a bunker or a hole. Uh, I just told them to dig up the fresh graves. Uh, whatever they found, throw it out and get in those holes and stay there. The NVA circled us. Uh, we were low on ammunition. Uh, they probed us all night. They broke our uh, lines. Some guys came through delivering grenades like it was the LA Times. Uh, I, I told the troops, nobody gets out of their holes. Uh, anything that moves, you shoot. We did run out of ammo. I called uh, for more resupply. And God bless him, uh, Lang Forehand came up in the autos <clears throat> and uh, delivered us. Uh, believe it or not, I couldn't use them in the M16s. They were uh, they were tank ammos, uh, rounds in. And I screamed back to it was the, either the three or the four. I said I can't use these damn rounds. Uh, they're not going to fit in the M16s. <laughs> and uh, Lang Forehand got word of that and came back a second time and dropped off grenades and small arms uh, ammunition. And and if he wouldn't have done that. If he would not have done that, I think we were down to about 60 rounds. We would not have survived. All these years, I think it was me that made the mistake and sent the wrong ammunition to the wrong people, but I didn't dare tell Captain Forehand. But when he found out, he said, well, let's load up this ammunition, take it over to golf, and pick up the tank ammunition, bring it back to them. And we had to cross about 1,500 meters of enemy territory, and we picked up a couple of Marines on the way back. That night, we received probing attacks in all of our positions, and especially in the area where Dolph Company was located in Dido. They were able, however, to hang on. And the next morning, we were able to launch Echo Company in a pre-dawn assault across the open area between Dido and Anlac. And they were successful after heavy fighting of fighting their way into Dido. And once they stalled in their attack due to heavy enemy resistance, Captain Livingston moved his reserve platoon forward and personally led it through the remainder of that village. And I passed the word over the radio to fix bayonets. And you could hear the clicking of 150 bayonets down that whole line of troops. You don't believe how that really affects your attitude and your momentum or desire to move out and get the job done. And I'll tell you, and if I look back on that battle, probably the most important thing we did was that one act. So I took the reserve platoon and so I guess uh, moved up to the leadership position of that platoon and began uh, punch the third platoon between the first and second platoon. And we were able to form some skirmish lines, finally penetrate the North Vietnamese, overcome their line of resistance, which was a significant amount of bunkers. Uh, and the individual Marines were absolutely magnificent. It was close in fighting, almost hand to hand, trench line to trench line, bunker to bunker. And you had to absolutely love those kids. And finally, we overcome the obstacle. We were able to finally link up with Gob Company and Jay Vargas's outfit. And we consolidated uh, the position and uh, licked our wounds, uh, recovered our dead, redistributed the ammunition, and there weren't many of us left. As I recall, there was only 25 or 30 left. They were either wounded or dead. Simultaneously with the assault by Echo Company, Golf Company broke out of their positions 